So, feminism. There are numerous ideas around it, what it constitutes exactly, who it's for, and even whether it's still relevant. So firstly, for clarity, it is defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of the equality of the sexes. Feminism isn't an ideology per se, as it actually now refers to a set of ideologies and movements which still aim to define, bring about, and defend equal social, economic, and cultural rights. There are now many variations of feminism, including radical, liberal, postmodern, psychoanalytical, and multiracial feminism, amongst many others, of course. However, in this instance, I'm going to be discussing the traditional notion of first wave feminism, which occurred during the 19th and early 20th centuries, concerned with the enfranchisement of women and gaining the right to vote. Activities within this period were focused on the promotion of equal contract, marriage, parenting, and property rights for women. Yet by the end of the 19th century, ongoing activism had come to be focused primarily on gaining political power, particularly the issue of women's suffrage. Now, I feel it must be noted here that there wasn't simply one suffrage movement or campaign. The movement was large and diverse, with many branches which all held differing standpoints and aims. Some branches were non-militant and peaceful, whereas some undertook extreme methods of agitation. Some were concerned only with votes for women, while some were also actively working for additional campaigns concerning women's sexual, reproductive and economic rights. Within the movement, women were able to work with whom they agreed towards the objectives of which they approved. Although many branches were peaceful in nature and stressed the need for persuasion rather than direct confrontation, there were branches who believed that this method didn't go far enough and sought to move towards and use more militant methods. It must be stated though, that initially feminism wasn't concerned with positive change per se, but rather with removing the barriers which kept women in this uneducated and unsupported state. So, I wanted to briefly provide an overview on the origins of feminism. Now, it began in the mid-Victorian calm in Langham Place Circle, and this centre based their ideologies and aims on previous works, such as the vindication of the rights of women by Mary Wollstonecraft, often considered the grandmother of modern feminism. The centre had within it a library, meeting rooms, and an employment bureau, and was primarily concerned with the education of women. It was, most importantly, the first organised movement working for British feminism. As part of this, the organisation began to publish a periodical to enable the dissemination of their ideals, called the English Woman's Journal. It was created in 1858 and ran until 1864, and we'll return to this shortly. Throughout the 19th century, a new breed of woman had begun to appear, characterised by her disillusionment of her place within society, her independence and her single status, and the feminist movement was initially focused on and undertaken by her. Here, I refer to the new woman, also known as the girl of the period. Now, previously, it was assumed in line with expectations of polite society and the rise of the middle class, that these women would be supported by the men of their family, fathers and brothers before marrying, after which she would be supported by her husband. However, a higher number of women reaching adulthood than men meant that there was an excess of women, and these commonly became, became known as surplus women. These women had no support system in place. Now, it's well known that women of the middle and upper classes were subordinate to men, the angels in the house, to paraphrase Virginia Woolf, and that they were actually considered childlike and in need of protection. But now it became clear that many of these women, considered surplus, would have to fend for themselves. Due to this, the education and employment of women became a key concern, hence the rise of organisations such as the Langham Place Circle. Obviously, there were two opposing sides to the feminist debate, which I'll discuss now. Now, I'm going to quote an article entitled Are Men Naturally Cleverer Than Women? from the English Woman's Journal from 1859. And it reads thus. Many persons, even many women, believe that the female intellect is naturally inferior to the male, and that under no circumstances whatever could it be equalised. And it is against this theory that we enter our protest, for it is of such a discouraging nature that it tends to realise itself. If we are convinced that our condition is hopeless, that the Creator himself has fixed on us the stamp of inferiority, 
why should we struggle against our inevitable doom? Let us rather bear our lot with resignation and making no opposition to the decrees of providence, content ourselves with hoping that in another world, we may be promoted to a more honorable position. But though we utterly repudiate this creed, we are not going to contend that as affairs now stand, men and women are generally on intellectual equality. Far be it from us to make an assertion which the experience of almost everyone must prove to be untrue. For to whom do we turn for assistance in an affair of difficulty, to our male or female relatives? When we want a good investment for our money, do we ask the advice of our aunts or of our uncles? A stout asserter of the present equality of the female intellect will say yes, but we apply to our uncle instead of our aunt, not because she's inferior in intelligence, but because he has had the most experience in money matters and has studied the subject of investments for years, while she has never turned her mind that way. And this is exactly the point at which we wish to arrive. Men are superior to women because they know more, and they have this knowledge because they have three times the opportunities of acquiring it than women possess. So, although this is an example of one text written in support of feminism, and proceeds to discuss exactly how women can access the resources they need to improve their intellect and knowledge, there were many, many voices in the period who believed that the natural order was being subverted and that society itself was at risk. Now, it's of note that many of the voices fighting against feminism were women. One key commentator was Eliza Lynn Linton, who wrote several pieces on the rise of the new woman, also known as the girl of the period. This piece has that exact title, The Girl of the Period, and is from the Saturday Review from 1868, and reads thus. Men hold nothing so dear as the honour of their women, and no one living would willingly lower the repute of his mother or his sisters. It is only when these have placed themselves beyond the pale of masculine respect that such things could be written as they are written now. When they become again what they were once, they will gather round them the love and homage and chivalrous devotion which were then an Englishwoman's natural inheritance. The marvel in the present fashion of life among women is how it holds its ground in spite of the disapprobation of men. It used to be an old time notion that the sexes were made for each other and that it was only natural for them to please each other and to set themselves out for that end. But the girl of the period does not please men she pleases them as little as she elevates them and how little she does that. The class of women she has taken as her models of itself testifies. All men whose opinion is worth having prefer the simple and genuine girl of the past, with her tender little ways and pretty bashful modesties to this loud and rampant modernization, with her false red hair and painted skin talking slang as glibly as a man, and by preference leading, leading the conversation to doubtful subjects. She thinks she is piquant and exciting when she thus makes herself the bad copy of a worse original. And she will not see that though men laugh with her, they do not respect her. Though they flirt with her, they do not marry her. She will not believe that she is not the kind of thing they want and that she is acting against nature and her own interests when she disregards their advice and offends their taste. All we can do is wait patiently until the national madness has passed and our women have come back again to the old English ideal, once the most beautiful, the most modest, the most essentially womanly in the world. These two pieces quite neatly demonstrate the strength of opinion around the woman question during the 19th century. As alluded to in Linton's piece, it was commonly held that women should be womanly, should be concerned with attracting a husband and not concerned with women's liberation. The previous piece, however, is quite clearly concerned with clarifying why women are not equal with men and then proposing ways in which this can and should be rectified. Although these two pieces are from the mid-Victorian period, clear parallels can be drawn with the modern feminist movement. Women and girls today are understood to be able to have it all, a career and a family. However, there remain social commentators who state that women cannot do this and that women actually belong in the home, undertaking a caring role for her family and children. This concept of nature being subverted continues. Consider, for example, how often women are represented as simply not being as good as men at sciences or logical thinking, or how often it's stated that boys and men are not as well suited to be caring and empathetic. 
It could be that in the first piece, stating that neither men nor women are superior or inferior at a particular task, but rather that one gender has more time to practice one than the other is correct. Although these issues were first discussed around 150 years ago, the concepts and themes within are as relevant today as ever. Therefore, back to Victorian Britain from where this concept emerged. Women were in every way subservient to the men in their life and expected to remain in the private sphere of home and church, responsible for overseeing of the household and the moral well-being of their family within. However, women of the middle and upper classes, as part of their role as the angel in the house, were responsible for the management of the household. Already then, contradictions are apparent. Women were subservient, yet held key responsibilities. Women were subservient, yet were the moral guardians of their family and subsequently wider society. Throughout the 19th century, work undertaken under the guise of social reform of philanthropy increased and assisting and educating the poor fell within this. As women were already guardians of the home and moral welfare of their family, it was seen as a natural extension for them to undertake social reform activities such as visiting the poor and encouraging them to be good, temperate and frugal. Through undertaking these activities, women were then able to move out of the home, the private sphere, into the public sphere. I personally believe that there were actually three spheres in place here. The feminine private sphere, the masculine public sphere, and the feminine public sphere. A space where women were able to undertake respectable reform work without having their reputation called into question. The doctrine of separate spheres began to break down and women were able to begin to move between these spheres and gain a level of independence they had previously been denied. However, this move had to be balanced between a move towards liberation and yet still remaining respectable within polite society. This juxtaposition can be illustrated thus. The periodical London Society was published from 1862 to 1898 and was aimed at the respectable and bourgeois middle classes the organisation behind the publication had a woman secretary, considered acceptable as women were enabled to seek suitable employment in order to support themselves. However, it's of note that the woman secretary was required to be a married woman. All correspondence was sent from the secretary and this stipulation demonstrates a desire, considering the intended audience of the magazine, to remain respectable. Of course, in the beginning of the following century, there were those women who chose to opt out of respectability and, as alluded to previously, chose to use more militant campaigning tactics. The obvious example of this is the Women's Social and Political Union, known as the WSPU. Founded in 1903, the organisation undertook increasingly militant tactics in their attempts to secure voting rights for women and the actions of the union can be categorised into three distinct phases the disruption of political meetings, carrying out threats to public order and undertaking a programme of civil disobedience, and undertaking attacks on the property of people and institutions opposed to suffrage. The aim of the WSPU was to be arrested, be subsequently imprisoned and then go on hunger strike, which it was hoped would embarrass the government and rally support to their cause. Now, Imagine if the women working towards change in the mid-Victorian period were greeted as they were, illustrated in Linton's piece, that the women using more militant tactics would have been greeted with greater derision and even violence toward them. Once women were deemed to have opted out of society, they were deemed fair game and were subject to violence and assault. Consider now how women working towards feminism and for women's rights are often subject to gendered violence and abuse. Once again, these issues remain relevant. However, this didn't deter Victorian campaigners and the deeds not words slogan of the WSPU remains extremely well known as the rallying call for the fight for women's suffrage. Although this is a small insight into the complexities surrounding the woman question within 19th century society, and the aims and objectives of the first wave feminist movement, feminism didn't end there. There have been subsequent second and third waves of feminism as the movement towards full social and economic rights for women continues. These subsequent waves have concerned family issues, workplace rights, a greater awareness of gendered violence, reproductive rights, and perhaps more recently, 
representations of women in the media and the reclaiming of derogatory terms. What is clear, however, is that these themes and ideas first considered over 150 years ago are still relevant and that feminism is not simply something consigned to history. <laughs>